Hey, welcome to the seven days ending May 5, 2023. This is the moral news number 10 for this period. Let's start with Calvin Robinson, who has a comment to say about the Church of England and GAFCON and the big change we talked about in the previous week. The Church of England is now in apostasy and the Anglican Communion will look to elect a new first among equals to replace the Archbishop of Canterbury. A bold move, necessary, but a bold one indeed, and one that will hopefully provide unity in Christ, promoting fear of God over fear of the world. The Anglican Communion is back on track. The chaff has been separated from the wheat. God is working through his church. We should be shaping our lives around the scriptures rather than attempting to shape the scriptures around our lives. You know, it's hard not to cheer along with Calvin Robinson as he excoriates, as he eviscerates, as he uh, simply tells the truth that the uh, the Church of England has left the room, the Christian room. It's not in there anymore uh, with its idea of blessing, same-sex union, marriage, whatever it is. So, yeah, good for him. Uh, check this out as he talks further about the family. It is somewhat related news. The Church of England released a disappointing report this week titled Love Matters, promoting the idea that all family types are equally good. The C of E report used the love is love type language, saying, quote, the quality of family relationships matters more than the form a family takes. Again, undermining the Bible, which teaches the natural God-ordained form for a family is one man and one woman joined together in holy matrimony for the purposes of raising a family for the worship of God. The church has gone from promoting a particular family structure as the ideal to denigrating the traditional nuclear family in order to be diverse, equitable and inclusive, none of which are Christian values. One could even concede that there are alternative family structures without passing any judgment, whilst still affirming that the Christian family is a mother and a father rearing children. Why the Church of England feels the need to be so inclusive it waters down its own principles is beyond me. Love is love? No, God is love. The Church of England gets it wrong yet again. At this point, it's starting to feel like they're doing it on purpose. The new religion of woke has replaced the old faith of Christianity. Now. You might say, wait a minute, we have to disagree with that. You know, diversity, equity, and inclusion are Christian values. The way they're being used today, the way they are presented, those, I agree with Calvin Robinson again, those are not Christian values. <laughs> and so, how long are we going to just uh, be nice uh, while they destroy, utterly destroy the foundations of our civilization? I like stripping out the family, that's kind of like a giant no-no. So anyway, give some thought to that. All right, let's go to another item today. This is an item about persecution and artificial intelligence. Listen. What most concerns you when it comes to AI and the persecuted church? Well, the example that pops out that is a clear and present danger is China and their use of artificial intelligence to monitor the movement of their population. In particular, then, they have a social scoring system which tracks church attendance and can prohibit children under the age of 18 from going to church, or if it can't prohibit it, it will certainly punish you on your social score. So that's happening right now. What we're trying to raise the alarm on is the effects that will grow as more and more of these artificial intelligence technologies come online, the way in which the biases of and assumptions that are built into this predictive modeling could affect religious faith. In particular, uh, obviously, we're focused right now on the persecution of Christians, the monitoring of Christian activity, the censorship of, of uh, worship services, pastors, posting of videos, all the various implications of artificial intelligence. Now, as we think about artificial intelligence, uh, really, it's it's a tool. It can be used to persecute anybody at any time. But keep a couple of things in mind here. First of all, artificial intelligence, there's no such thing as artificial conscience. <laughs> right? God gives the conscience, and humans get it. Machines don't. No machine has a conscience. A machine can do what it's programmed to do. If it's got a very sophisticated algorithm that decides what it does, it's still just an algorithm. You cannot create a, a conscientious algorithm. That's part of the heritage of humanity. So, and as the cost of surveillance decreases, as the cost of uh, watching people, monitoring them, like, like it, would, it wouldn't be hard 
take to take everything that I say. Uh, I've got a thousand devotional videos up here online now, uh, just from the Bible, almost all of it, just straight out from the Bible. And my opinion, I guess, is mixed in there. My understanding, as I pray the Holy Spirit is leading me. But you know what? In a computer somewhere, and perhaps it already has, it's gone through and nailed everything down, kind of has a sense of what I think and how I think. And on the day that when the day comes, when they uh, take Christians and remove us from the uh, public sphere, um, all that's going to come into play. So I have no illusions about that, but it's the truth and I'm going to speak the truth. And uh, while I can use this uh, microphone, uh, YouTube, I will. So we'll just try that out uh, for now. Anyway, uh, watch the whole thing. I encourage you to watch the whole thing. It's well worth it. Uh, the title, if you want to do a little search for it, I mean, until it becomes unfindable. <laughs> but the title is Raise the Alarm, How Artificial Intelligence Could Harm Persecuted Christians. And he deals with China. He deals with uh, deep fakes. Those are like fake photographs and videos that look real and can be generated now by, by AI. Uh, people doing things, apparently, that they never did. But you've got here, look, here's the photographic evidence. So, yes, this is going to create some problems uh, because you can accuse and attack anybody and look here's the photographic evidence So we won't be able to trust that anymore. Take a look. It's worth it. It's it's eight or nine minutes long uh, And just a primer on some of the stuff happening Okay, let's go to the third item today and this involves a 12 year old school student who wore a shirt to school that he ought not have Anyone else on anything not in tonight's agenda? So he's going to address the Please school go right ahead. here. Check out the second guy from the right in the blue shirt Welcome. He's looking forward to this. I don't think he knows who it is. I don't think he knows what's coming, but uh, here it comes. Hello. Here comes the shotgun blast. Good evening. Blast. My so, name is Liam Morrison. I live. I'm in the seventh, tenth grade at Nichols Middle School. I appreciate the opportunity to speak to you today. I never thought that the shirt I wore to school on March 21st would lead me to speak with you today. On that Tuesday morning, I was taken out of gym class to sit down with two adults for what turned out to be a very uncomfortable talk. I was told that people were complaining about the words on my shirt, that my shirt was making some students feel unsafe. Yes, words on a shirt made people feel unsafe. They told me that I wasn't in trouble, but it sure felt like I was. I told, I was told that I would need to remove my shirt before I could return to class. When I nicely told them that I didn't want to do that, they called my father. Thankfully, my dad supported my decisions and came to pick me up. What did my shirt say? Five simple words. There are only two genders. Nothing harmful, nothing threatening. Just a statement I believe to be a fact. I have been told that my shirt was targeting a protected class. Who is this protected class? Are their feelings more important than my rights? I don't complain when I see pride flags and diversity posters hung throughout the school. Do you know why? Because others have a right to their beliefs just as I do. Not one person, staff, or student told me that they were bothered by what I was wearing. Actually, just the opposite. Several kids told me that they supported my actions and that they wanted one too. I experienced, wait a moment. I was told that the shirt was a disruption to learning. No one got up and stormed out of class. No one burst into tears. I'm sure I would have noticed if they had. I experienced disruptions to my learning every day. Kids acting out in class are a disruption yet nothing is done. Why do the rules apply to one yet not another? I feel like these adults were telling me that it wasn't okay for me to have an opposing view. Their arguments were weak, in my opinion. I didn't go to school that day to hurt feelings or cause trouble. I have learned a lot from this experience. I learned that a lot of other students share my view. I learned that adults don't always do the right thing or make the right decisions. I know that I have a right to wear those five, a shirt with those five words. Even at 12 years old, I have my own political opinions and I have a right to express those opinions. Even at school, this right is called the First Amendment to the Constitution. My hope in being here tonight is to bring the school committee's attention to this issue. I hope that you will speak up for the rest of us so we can express ourselves without being pulled out of class. Next time, it may not only be me. There might be more students that decide to speak out. Thank you for your time and good night. So I like the question this kid asked. Are their feelings more important than my rights? My First Amendment, not just my rights in a vague sense, but my rights in a First Amendment sense. You might remember, Christian, that the First Amendment has to do with uh, freedom of speech, freedom of assembly, a freedom of worship. The state is not allowed to make rules and, and, and do anything to do to mess with your worship. 
So First Amendment is kind of like the whole, it's like the pin and the hole in the hand grenade. You take out the First Amendment and you've got nothing. So this kid is standing up for the right thing. Uh, may his tribe increase and may our tribe increase. We who uphold the First Amendment. We, we don't want people to feel bad, but at the end of the day, you know, we have to uphold everybody's rights um, because if we don't uphold the rights to freedom of expression, we will be in a tyranny faster than you can spit. Okay. That might not be a good illustration, but considering the state of the moral news, maybe it fits. Hey, have a wonderful next seven days, and we'll see you back Friday-ish. Bye-bye.